Well, good morning to everybody. Hang, I need to fix something here. Hang on a minute. Get this over here. All right, sorry about that. Good morning, everybody. I am Pastor Josh, and it is a joy to have everybody here with us um, this morning. Um, welcome to all of you. I see you coming up on on my screen down here. Um, just, uh, I don't really have any announcements today other than our songs. We're going to do... Uh, remember last week I had asked everybody to send me suggestions of songs and all of that that you want to hear, things that you want me to preach about, songs you want us to sing and all of that. So one of the songs that was texted to me that we should sing is Standing on the Promises. So we will do verses 1 and 2 of Standing on the Promises and then um, at the end we'll do uh, just a little bit of the, the new song, The Blessing. So we're not going to do the whole thing because if you know that song, it's about seven minutes long. So we're not going to do the whole thing. We'll just do um, a little bit of that one. So um, this is an all request Sunday. The message is about what you asked for, and that's what I'm going to be preaching on the next um, few weeks. I don't know how long, but it's on things that you want me to talk about, things that you, a message that you want to hear. So if you have any of those, you can either comment um, below or you can, I don't know if it's below whatever you're watching on, some of it it's comment below, some right or some left, but um, you can comment, you can send me a text message, you can email me. Let me know what are some topics or some themes or things that you want to hear a sermon about and I will do that. Today I'm going to uh, be able to cover about the vast majority of the, the topics that you asked me to preach about um, from last week, so I will do that. Um, so let's open up in, in prayer, and then we'll sing our first song, Standing on the Promises. God, we thank you for gathering us here together this morning. Even though we are apart, we are still together in this, this place. We know, God, that the church isn't a place we gather. The church is a people who we are. And we, we thank you, God, that even though we're apart, you still call us to be the church. You call us to be the, the church now in, in ways that that we couldn't have even imagined in more ways than, than, than we even know. And we pray, God, that today as we, we gather together virtually, that you would open all of our hearts and open our minds and really open our spirits to hear what you are speaking to each one of us in these, these times of fear, these times of, of discomfort. And we pray, God, that you would allow us to just stand on the promises that you have made to 
to us that you are always with us. We ask, God, that, that you would be with us this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Standing on the promises of Christ my King Through eternal ages let His praises ring Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God Thank you to the person who sent that one in. I'm not going to name you by by name, but that is, a, for some reason, for me, that's a tough one to do and play on guitar. It's in kind of a weird, I don't know what the the, the timing is of it. I think it's probably three, four, but that's a, a tough one to do on guitar. Um, so it stretched me a little bit to learn that one on, on guitar. Um, our scripture for this morning, we're just going to get right into, into this because the message is a little bit longer this morning. It's more uh, akin to what I would do on a typical Sunday when we're gathered together. So it is a little bit bit longer. Don't tune out. Uh, don't leave uh, because I believe that it's something. there's something in this for, for all of us during these, these times. So our scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of Matthew. It's chapter 14, and I'm going to start with verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, Jesus said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. So I asked last week um, to give me topics of what you want to hear about. And, and one of the, the themes that a lot of you asked about was a sermon on comfort in difficult times. You asked about um, times of fear or, or what would Jesus say to us now? That was overwhelmingly the, the request that I got. What would Jesus say to us now? What would Jesus say to us in in difficult times? How would Jesus offer us comfort in these times? Now, I'm going to loosely wrap all of those up into one message because really they're all centered around the the same thing. Well, I remember when I rode my very first roller coaster. I was probably nine my parents would probably remember this too. I was probably nine years old and it was at Valley Fair. I was super excited this year because, you know, I grew up and I was always kind of a short kid. So 
So I, didn't, I wasn't ever tall enough to ride roller coasters, but I remember that first year when I was finally tall enough to be able to, to get on the roller coaster and not have to wait down with, with the rest of the family. I'm the oldest cousin, so, so all of my other cousins, they were too short and too little to, to be able to ride. And I, I, I remember that, that year when finally I could ride it. And everybody, the rest of the, all the adults in the family were saying, my aunts and uncles were saying how fun it was going to be and how much I would love it. And they said it wasn't scary at all. And, and so, so I was pumped up. I was ready to ride this roller coaster. I sit down in the seat in, in our, our cart right next to my dad. And the, you know, the lap bar that comes down, it comes down over our legs. And it was really, it just came down to my dad's legs. So if if you know my dad at all, he is really tall. Some of you from Cornerstone have, have met him. He's, he's considerably taller than, than I am. He's about six foot five. And I was a short kid. I'm still kind of a, a shorter, shorter adult. But so there was about a foot in between the, the lap belt, the, the lap bar, and my legs, the, the thing that was offering me safety, the thing that was holding me into, into my seat. But I'm still not worried. The, the operator, you know, the ride operator does this to, to let everybody or to let the, them know that it's, it's time, it's ready to go. The ride is going to start, and I'm still not worried. And we, we start that ascent up that very first hill. And if you've ridden a roller coaster or know anything about them at all, you know that there's that clunking of the, the chain-driven pulley that's pulling this, this train full of riders up that first hill. And I still thought, oh, this isn't so bad. We get about halfway up when my dad says, hey, look down and wave to Grandma, who was waiting down, and she was waving at the, the rest of us who were riding the ride. Hey, wave to Grandma. See, up until that point on that ride, all that I could see with my eyes was the back of the seat in front of us, the back of the car in front of us because I was so short. Now, I didn't realize that when I did this, and I look forward, and I look over the edge that I would actually see the ground. And I not only saw the ground when I did that, but I saw people on the ground, small people, tiny people. And that was all it took for me, and I got scared. I was terrified once I looked down. See, I had lost that forward view, the, the good view to me, the safe view to me, and I had looked down. Now, I did not wave to my grandma. In fact, I don't know that my hands ever left the, the bar, the lap bar, for the rest of the ride, and they probably had to pry my, my fingers off the bar at the end of the ride. Now, I did not ride another roller coaster that year. I was too scared. I love roller coasters now, but that year, I did not ride another roller coaster because I was terrified. And does that story ring true with anybody else? In our text for this morning, we, we read of one man, Jesus, walking on the water. And then we, we read of another man, Peter, who starts to walk on the water. But then Peter got scared. That one moment of fear was all that it took. Once Peter got scared, he started to sink like a rock. And he called out to Jesus, save me. And we all know, of course, what Jesus did. After telling Peter that he has little faith, Jesus saved Peter. And, and I don't know about you, but I can almost hear when I read that, I can almost hear the sarcasm in, in the voice of Jesus. Can't you, when you read that, can't you just hear a, a little bit of sarcasm in Jesus' voice? I, I can hear frustration. I can, I can hear the, the frustrated sigh and and I can see Jesus kind of, you know, shaking his head. And his head goes down. And Peter, Peter. Now, Peter, of all people, should not have had little faith. Peter is, is one of the elite called out and set apart 12. Now, you all know, many of you anyways, know that Peter is my favorite of all of the disciples a flawed but faithful person. 
You know, in all of the gospel lists of, of the disciples, Peter's name is always the first one mentioned. Fun fact. That indicates maybe the high status that Peter had, even among the other 12 disciples. Peter's name is always included in, in what's known as the inner circle, which was the two sets of brothers, which is Peter and, and Andrew, and then the other set of brothers, James and John. So Peter and Andrew, James and John, they were the inner circle of four. And if you remember uh, other places in the Bible, that inner circle of four disciples was at some, some special events with Jesus, healings, the transfiguration, Mount Olivet, um, the, the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, among others. So Peter, he's seen firsthand many times exactly what Jesus can do. And he probably knows Jesus really, really, really well. But when it came to having true faith and deep abiding trust in Jesus, Peter still had some fear. Peter still had some doubt when it, when it came to taking the step of faith and walking towards Jesus on the water. Now, here's your, your Greek lesson for the, the week. You can look all of this up. Don't be impressed by, by my vast knowledge of the, the Greek Bible because I have none, even though I, I had to take a, a year of it in seminary. I don't remember any of it. So I looked this up. And well, I actually did know this, but here's your, your, your lesson. The Greek word from which we get the name Peter is Petros, which we get the English word petrified, which we all know means to harden or turn into rock. It can also mean a high level of fear. So do you see the irony in that, that word? Petros, Peter, petrified, rock, scared. There's irony in that. Peter, whose name means rock, has some fear and doubt, and he sinks like a rock. But he was petrified, scared. And the point I'm trying to make is that even, even Peter had some doubt. Peter, one of Jesus' closest disciples, a member of the inner circle, had times of doubt in his own faith. Now, I'm being a little bit hard on, on uh, this disciple, Peter. I'm being a little bit tough on him. Does anyone remember what Peter did for a living before being called to be a disciple? Do you remember what he did? Peter was a fisherman. Now, the text doesn't say exactly who Peter was in the boat with. Matthew doesn't say exactly who he was in, in that boat with, but we can draw the conclusion. Earlier I said that Peter was always mentioned with the same group of four disciples. In fact, every time the disciples are mentioned in the Bible, there's a, a clear pattern of how they're mentioned. The 12 disciples are always split up into three groups of four. So Peter is always mentioned along with his brother Andrew and James and John. All four of these disciples, this foursome, are fishermen. So what does that mean? It means that these four men made a living on the water. Now our text says that there were waves and wind. Their boat was being tossed. Now think about that. There were waves and wind. Their boat was being tossed. Now those must have been some crazy big waves. That must have been some howling wind. Because these men made their living on the water. But when Peter, so they'd experienced wind and waves. Wind and waves were probably not that big a deal for them. But they were scared. They were scared. But they made their living on the water and they were scared. So Peter gets out of the boat, walks toward Jesus, and he got scared. So maybe, maybe we shouldn't be so tough on Peter. Maybe we should give Peter a little bit of credit because, because he asked Jesus to call him out, which Jesus did. Now, if they were wind, if there was the, that crazy of wind and waves, and Peter actually had enough faith to say, Jesus, if it's you, call me out. 
Call me out there. That is a little bit of faith. But Peter did get out despite the wind and the waves. He, he went out in faith. He had a brief moment of fear, but you know what? When it came right down to it, who did Peter turn to in his fear? Peter turned to the only person who he knew could save him. He reached out to Jesus. So really, I mean, Peter did have some doubt. He did have fear, but he still remembered where to turn. Now, Matthew tells us this story. He tells us this story to let us know about something that happened on a dark and stormy night to Jesus and his followers. But what if, what if there's a, a greater purpose to this story? What if we, we, now this story is not one of Jesus' parables, but what if we look at it as Matthew telling us a parable? What if this story is a parable about the church? What if it is a parable about the church? What if it describes the church as a boat that's filled with scared, fearful, doubting disciples sailing on a storm-tossed sea we call life. That's kind of where we're at right now, isn't it? In these times of social distancing and isolation and and fear because of COVID-19. Fearful, isolated, alone, scared, doubting. That's not an easy image for us to grasp, is it? We don't like to think of the the church as a, a frail structure filled with people who are filled with with fear and doubt. But here's the thing. Matthew's picture of the church is a lot more accurate than we want to admit. The church seems more and more and more to be like a fragile boat just struggling to stay afloat in this world that's filled with with dangers and disappointments and fears and sickness and illness. Sickness and death, not just from from the the coronavirus and all that, but, but every disease is invading our world all over the place. It's the same everywhere. Events in our world and in our private lives are, are threatening our faith and causing many of us to wonder, where's God? Where's God? Right now, the, the seas of, of our, our little boat are, are churning with Mental health struggles, a culture that's saturated with with guns and addiction and and glorified images of violence. Combine all of that with with being distant from those who, who we love, being isolated from those who we love and from those who love us back. Friends, it's stormy out there on the sea of life in 2020. It's stormy. Matthew painted a picture of the church as a fragile boat being tossed around by every wave that comes along. What if that's what he was doing? And whether we choose to admit that or not, that picture is frighteningly accurate. But into that gloomy picture comes the only person who can save us. Into that stormy sea of life, Jesus comes walking on the dangerous waters, feeling the the force of the waves on his face, tasting the the salt water on his lips, feeling the, the strength of the wind pushing at his back, but fearing nothing. Jesus knows the danger, but he comes to join the disciples to walk with us through the storm and to save us from the waves. And now, does that mean that the storms are going to stop if we keep our focus on Jesus? Probably not. Maybe, but maybe not. 
the storms might continue, sometimes for what, what might seem like a really long time. I mean, how long have we been, been in this fight against the coronavirus? A couple months seems like a long time, but if you look at it in perspective, it's really not that long in the grand scheme of life. How long have we been isolated? A long time, and, and it's going to continue for even longer, but not that long in the grand scheme of, of life. How long has, have we been in this battle or that battle? You can fill in the blank and add whatever storm it is that you're facing. How long have I been battling this, this addiction? How long have I been battling this anger? How long have I been battling this or that? Fill in the blank with whatever storm it is that you're facing. But through the spray and the splash of the waves in that storm, in the sea of your life, Jesus will be there calling out to you, take heart, it's I. Do not be afraid. Now, I was actually going to use a, a few other scriptures and go a different um, direction in this message, but I'm not going to. But let me just say that, that in the Bible, one person asked, you know, um, about hearing from God in times of, of, of isolation. And let me say that in the Bible, a lot of the time, in fact, I'll go out on a limb and say most of the time, when people hear from God, guess where they are? Alone and isolated. Jesus would go to be alone and isolated to talk and hear from God. It's just food for thought, but I'm not going to go into that. But no matter where you are, no matter what storm of life you have to endure, know that Jesus is with you. We're never forsaken. We're never abandoned or left to our own resources. Even when we're not aware of his presence, even when we're asking, God, where are you? Jesus is there. Now, I was scared on that first roller coaster ride. That first hill actually wasn't that bad. It was those little fast, bumpy ones, you know, later on in the ride that actually scared me more than that first one. See, the lap bar, it wasn't keeping me in my seat. And if you ride roller coasters, you know, half of the fun now as an adult is actually coming a little bit out of your seat. But remember, I had about a foot between my legs and that lap bar. I flew out of my seat on every single one of those additional hills. But there was someone sitting in the seat right next to me who was keeping me from flying completely off the ride. Now, I don't think I would have flown completely off the ride, but it felt like it. There was someone sitting in the seat right next to me keeping me from flying off of that ride. My dad, he recognized my fear and he probably saw tears coming down my face because I'm sure I was crying. But he recognized my fear and he took his leg and he put it over my legs. And he took his, his arm and he put it around my, my shoulders. And, and he drew me closer to him and he wasn't going to let anything happen to me. He was there keeping me safe. Friends, there is no way that we can cope with the struggle and fears of everyday life by ourselves. We need Jesus. And here's the good news. We don't have to deal with it on our own. We need Jesus to give us a push now and then so that we will dare to step out of the boat, step out into the waves and enter into the struggles of, of all of God's people everywhere. We have to have that. And we have a Savior to accompany us and to help us through. Even though we're apart, even though we're, we're distant, and even though we're isolated, we are still the church. In fact, we have the opportunity to actually be the church. And remember, the church is not the building. The church is not a place that we gather. We gather in a building as the church. The church is the body of of Christ and Jesus is still with the body of Christ calling us to provide a calming presence to all of those who feel tossed about on the waves in the storm of life 
the unloved, the unlovely, the stranger, the outcast, the orphan, the hungry, the scared, those without faith. In this story, Matthew wants us to experience the storm. He wants us to realize that Jesus does not come to take away all of our hardships. Jesus does not come to take away all of our struggles or even all of our doubts. As long as we live on this earth, and Lord willing, that's going to be a long time, we're going to encounter storms. We will. That's the nature of life. That's the way it's been, and that's the way it likely will always be. But Matthew also tells us that Jesus is there with salt water on his lips, feeling the wind and the waves himself. I don't know what storm of life will come your way this week. I don't know what storm you're facing right now. But I do know this. Even as the the storm rages all around you, even as we're apart, even as we're isolated, even as we, we battle against sickness and disease and all kinds of illness, if you listen carefully with your heart, I promise you'll hear a gentle voice calling out to you, take heart, it's I. Do not be afraid. I am here. Let's pray. God, we... We thank you that you call us out of the boat, even, even as we're scared, even as we're, we're isolated, even as we battle storms in our lives. We thank you, God, that you are always telling us, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. We ask, God, that in all of the, the storms in our lives that we're facing, I, I pray, God, that, that you would just constantly remind us that, that you are with us, that you are here, you will keep us safe, and you'll give us comfort, and you will give us peace. We ask this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we, we go forth, our our last song is the blessing, and some of you know these words. Well, most of you probably know these words because the words are actually the, the blessing that I most, most often refer to and go back to when I send you forth. The words are just, the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. So let's sing those, those words as our blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you.
peace, be blessed. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Go in peace. God bless you, and we will see you next Sunday.